Ready? Yes. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Oh, sorry. Yes. Good morning to everybody. Welcome to this morning section. We start with the second episode by the lecture of uh, Shasha Migdal. Please go ahead. <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to talk about technical details and result of solving the model. I hate the word model, but this is what it is. I, in the yesterday talk, I demonstrated equivalence, uh, dual equivalence of decaying turbulence uh, to some statistical model in one dimension. It's not like I am making up the model as usually by cooking up something which would look realistic and uh, represent in average or um, in some other sense, I'm claiming that this model is a solution of the loop equations, which are uh, the uh, Hopf equation of, for the turbulence. So I arrived to a particular statistical model, uh, model of spins on a uh, closed loop, uh, and some rational numbers. Now I'm going to describe solution of that model in a limit when the number of points I used to approximate it uh, on a loop goes to infinity, because that is what would correspond to continuum limit of the Navier-Stokes equation. Ah, okay. So, one new representation of the model is called Euler ensemble, and there is another representation of that ensemble which allows you to go further and solve it in continuum loop. Uh, and we'll start by replacing independent random variables sigma, which are plus minus one, Ising variables, with fixed sum uh, variables with fixed sum by a Markov process, as suggested in my previous work. So there is n random values of sigma equal one, and remaining n capital minus n values of sigma minus one. So instead of uh, averaging over all these values simultaneously, we follow a Markov process of picking um, sigma n and so on, sigma one, one after another. In other words, we uh, pick random numbers and then remove it from the pool, we fix the value, and then pick the next one. That's called conditional probabilities. And Markov process is remarkable in a sense that each step only depends on the current uh, number of remaining uh, uh, positive and negative spins. It's a very well-known property. It's called a random walk or drunkard walk. Uh, so each step is a step of a drunkard, and he is known to come home and then <laughs> but he's walking back and forth on the pavement. That's the process. And each step is uh, this sigma. So at each step, there will be uh, some number m, m capital remaining sigma. So we get transition from n to n minus one with probability, um, with probability n divided by m and uh, n will, n cap, n small will remain with complementary probability. Uh, multiplying this probability and summing over all histories of the Markov process is equivalent to computation of the product of Markov matrices. That's the theory of Markov process. So there is matrix with elements corresponding to probabilities of these two steps. So this is probability of the number of positive sigmas remaining intact, and this is the probability of, the, of this number diminishing by one. And uh, M is always diminishing, and you have a product of matrices. When you multiply these matrices, you get uh, two through the N um, terms correspond to these two alternatives in each matrix. So uh, the Markov process will be random until n go, uh, becomes zero, when there will be no more positive spins left, all the remaining spins will be negative, uh, and we'll pick them with probability one, or vice versa, of course, if, if there will be all the remaining spin, spins will be positive, then again, they will be positive with probability one. 
So that is the Markov chain. And here is the new steps, new ideas. Uh, Ising model, especially in one dimension, can be represented by the fermionic variables. Um, and uh, this is something which allows me to write the whole sum in one, in terms of one compact, compact operator expression. So let's consider uh, operator with fermionic creation annihilation operator, and there will be occupation numbers um, zero and one, and they correspond to one plus sigma over two. So uh, occupation numbers of fermion at, at the given point uh, could be either zero or one, and that would be in one-to-one -one correspondence to sigma being plus and minus one. So uh, this is anti-commutation relations uh, needed for that. And uh, a dagger is a creation operator. It is acting on arbitrary states. It selects only the state which has sigma equals minus one and forces it to the state sigma equal one. And uh, likewise, the uh, annihilation operator does the opposite. And the number new, a, a dagger n, is a very well known occupation number of the fermions. And these numbers are commuting with each other. So they are acting like numbers, but not just simple numbers, numbers which take only two values, zero and one. Uh, now, acting on arbitrary state, this uh, object only select the state with sigma equal one and uh, uh, et cetera. So number of positive sigmas coincides with the occupation number of these Fermi particles. And uh, that relation leads to representation of the Markov matrix as an operator. This is nu m, occupation, total occupation number, um, at state m, and this is nm. And nm is total sum of the all numbers from zero, from one to m. So that's the operator representation which would reproduce the same Markov chain. To my surprise, I haven't seen in the literature um, operator representation of Markov chain, but that's rather obvious for a physicist. So sigmas, of course, can be replaced as two new minus one. But that has far-reaching consequences. What is it? So Wilson loop can also be expressed in terms of these, um, of these uh, uh, variables. And I will skip the details, just write the result. It's fermionic trace. It's trace over all states of this, of this um, system of N fermions, and then there are a few factors. Uh, Z is a projection operator. It projects the states with given sum. So sigma, I described above, operator, two nu minus one. So this uh, fancy representation is just a Kronecker delta. When you integrate over the angle or variable on a circle, you select only sum of sigma equals one. So uh, this is Z, that's uh, just operator which selects from the st all states, the states with given sum. And uh, uh, this is, these are these matrices, the Markov matrices, and this is just normalization factor to make this psi equal one when gamma equals zero. And gamma is circulation, and it's obvious, just take the, uh, previous expression in terms of sigmas and uh, replace each sigma by the operator which has a meaning of charge density of fermions. So it will be sum over loop, delta C is just delta of the loop and that is omega rotation matters and P is uh, described on the next page. So P is the same expression as before yesterday with all, all these alphas angles expressed in terms of uh, occupation numbers of fermions. So it is almost tautological representation, but it has an important advantage. Uh, here you could go to continuum limit and understand what happens. Because summing over all two to the n spins was something 
combinatorical, which is very difficult to perform. This, instead of summing over two to the n terms, all these multiple sums are represented as one matrix products, and then you could see what happens in continuum limit. And what happens is um, classical limit when occupation numbers form a smooth um, density curve. And that is uh, the continuum limit of the system. Of course, the problem of the rational number P and Q doesn't go away, it still remains, but at least we could uh, reduce exponential number of variables, sigma, to some compact expression averaged over only two variables, P and Q. Yes. Uh, oh, beta is beta. They enter through beta. Beta is 2 pi times p over q. So beta is a uh, rational fraction of the 2 pi. And that's how uh, p and q enter. Yes. And r? Oh, r, um, r equals 0. I just skipped that part. Uh, it was analyzed that in this ensemble, in the limit of large n, in these sums over all these mm, uh, uh, winding numbers r, only the term r equals zero remains, and the other terms have weight one over, one over n. So I just skip that part. It was done by me, and I just conjectured, but then some experts in number theory, which published our pub now are publishing paper, about that uh, Euler ensemble. They liked the idea that there is a simple thing, Euler ensemble, very well-defined objects of number theory, which has something to do with turbulence. So they jumped into that and wrote a big paper on studying properties of that Euler ensemble. One of the things they proved is what I conjectured before, is that R equals zero dominates the sum. So. Uh, as we shall shortly see in the continuum limit, when n goes to infinity, the accumulated numbers of Fermi particles um, and Dirac holes, so this is particles, and these are holes, uh, tend to some classical function of the position. So if you imagine the uh, index uh, on the um, index of this fermion as a position on the uh, line from zero to one, so index is ratio of, uh, uh, continuous coordinate is ratio of index to one, and the density, uh, charge density, which is the sigma, uh, will tend to some classical function. And that's the whole idea. So when we do that, we get something which is already much simpler. This is just an identical representation. I just put exponent, um, product of these factors because they all commute into exponential, you get log of ratio of n plus and n minus, and then you get delta n, which is always one. Uh, so delta n plus, delta n minus. So delta n uh, at each transition, delta n plus is one and delta n minus zero and, and vice versa. So that is identical representation of the same product as exponential of the sum. But now it has continuum limit. Uh, so these n plus minus are uh, number of spins. And then we introduce some functions, which are uh, fun smooth functions of f, of, of psi. And then we, that's just formula presentation that if, if it is, uh, that's just identical representation. If there's an integer part of n psi, then, mm, sum of integral of f prime is sum of delta functions and formal integral of f, uh, involving f prime will involve, will reduce to the sum. So it's again, just the way to go to continuum limit. Okay, so then these sums can be written as integrals. Integral df plus, which is f prime, f plus prime times d xi times logarithm and uh, this. Now, the beauty of this thing is that it, as we shall shortly see, can be integrated exactly. It's just an 
integrable. It's a total de integral of total derivative. And results will can respond to something rather obvious, which we will see in a moment. Now, we have to sum over all spins eta. Now I call them eta, which two through the n uh, terms. And uh, for each combination of etas, you have exponential of some of these terms. And uh, what we think will, is happening in the continuum limit, instead of summing or all histories of Markov process, you will get functional integral, path integral over the paths of this process. And I will discuss the measure in a moment. Um, so um, this path integral will be dominated by the classical history, maximizing the product of transitional probabilities if such a classical trajectory exists. Uh, the first term in the action, this uh, kinematical product of the um, Markov uh, matrices, uh, can be reduced to this integral. And this integral, uh, in fact, is uh, does not depend on trajectory, it can be integrated. And uh, it's okay, it's what we expected. If we, if we formally find the variation of that, you'll find it's zero, because the whole thing is total derivative. When you integrate it, you will get a very simple thing, log two minus sum or plus minus of this thing. And we recognize it. It's the same you get uh, in that limit from purely combinatorial factor. If you sum over all values of sigma equal plus minus one with given sum, you get the combinatorial product. That's a way to find, uh, to place uh, some number of positive and some number of negative spins randomly. It's binomial coefficient of n into, uh, this is number of positive ones and complementary number of number of negative. So if you take that logarithm of uh, binomial coefficient divided by n in the limit of n goes to infinity, it's exactly what we found. So that confirms that indeed these Markov matrices reproduce a correct combinatorial solution when you would not do a Markov process, but just sum over all values of spin. So you get binomial coefficient, and that's what we got in our continuum limit also. So that matches. But that also tells you that the result doesn't depend on the specific trajectory. Trajectory was arbitrary, but only depends on the s, variable s, which is the uh, pr over n. It's, it's just a, ra a, ra a ratio of, um, of the number of the rotations around the circle. And we see that this function actually um, uh, has sharp maximum at uh, s equals zero. That's what I told you. This means that uh, in the sum over S or integral over S, uh, the, only the top will dominate because this lambda uh, enters the uh, yeah. This lambda enters uh, the sum uh, with coefficient n. We divided this product by uh, logarithm of product by n, and we got this function. But in, it acts, it enters with a factor of n, which means that s will be uh, equal zero after, so at large n, only s equals zero remain. Now let's add the more interesting term, our circulation. And that second term uh, corresponds to classical action added to this path. So if this path or density uh, charge density is a smooth curve. So this thing can also be written as a smooth integral. And that uh, integral involves the following thing. It involves this vector f of xi, which x is x simply cos cosine and sine of this uh, beta n times this uh, charge density phi. And then there is this uh, loop, which also depends on, on the position of xi. And um, the formula um, is rather trivial, but still it's uh, functional of the loop and uh, it's not something you could easily compute. Um, now, uh, we assume that the trajectory was smooth. Now remember in original uh, formulation, when we had discrete sum, each step, each sigma was plus minus one. So absolute value of each step in that charge 
density was plus minus one. In terms of this variable alpha, which is uh, beta n times uh, phi, in terms of angular variable alpha, the step was um, alpha prime was plus minus one. So alpha prime squared was n beta squared. So we take a liberty of, of expressing sum with the unit steps by the uh, Gaussian distribution of alpha prime with the same value. So we assume that when you in continuum, when we sum our pass, instead of strict restriction of the step equal plus minus one, you could have Gaussian restriction as long as you keep the same mean square of alpha. That's um, universality of the path integral. So then we get a standard term in the measure which corresponds to kinetic energy for this alpha field. So you will get a simple one dimensional path integral. So you will have, you should have to sum our P and Q. You have to integrate over omega and then you have to integrate over paths uh, the alpha with the measure which I um, described before, this measure. And then there is, so this is kinetic energy for this trajectory and this potential term. It's integral over, over position psi. And then there is the phase factor. So we in fact have what's called U1 model. Our field is um, exponential, is the phase factor. And uh, the phase enters here in uh, kinetic energy. So it is not something easily calculable, but it's something at least which people could consider in integrable theories because it is um, one dimensional theory with potential uh, like, um, not completely will because it's exponential, it's uh, e to the i alpha. So um, people might try to solve that um, by uh, com continuous methods. I mean, there are some integrable systems, I don't know, sine Gordon or something where you have this, um, this equation which can be quantized. So I am not going to follow this path. Uh, there are experts in integrable systems. One dimensional system is a very simple case. Uh, and so there's kinetic energy, there's potential energy. And then on top of that, there is this summation over rational numbers, which is a very non-trivial thing. See, omega I defined before I just swallowed that definition. I hate electronics. You want me to pray? The omega. I'm pressing. The omega is a rotation matrix times a vector C. Very simple. So, uh, so that uh, and th that's what you sum over all these loops. Right. So, C omega is my potential. So, C is a loop. It's my external thing. So it's Wilson loop, which is a function of C. Uh, so I have kinetic energy, I'm functional integral paths called alpha. I have kinetic energy and I have potential energy integral over coordinate of exponential of I alpha. And this C omega is a complex the, version of the vector. So it's a functional of the C. Huh? It's a functional of C. Yes, it's a very, very functional trivial functional, C. it's linear. Uh, 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 linear function, it's linear function of C prime. And that's what makes it different from sine Liouville uh, or, uh, because you now have this uh, time dependent factor multiplying the E to the I alpha. Yeah, so, I mean, it's very well defined. Well, not very well defined because I don't know yet how to go to infinity and how to sum or P and Q, but at least at fixed P, Q and N, this is, something which looks like a well-defined functional integral, except rather a difficult one. But maybe people will be able, because classical equations corresponding to these actions are rather simple. If you find variation, here you get alpha two primes, and here you get um, uh, e to the i alpha. So it is some, 
equation, which is local equation, something like sine Gordon. But I haven't solved it. I only solved classical equation. If you just minimize this term without this, you will get a very simple thing. Uh, this thing will have a minimum when alpha cancels the phase of this C. So when alpha is argument of C with a minus sign, then uh, this thing has a minimum at uh, extremum. But with alpha prime, it's a serious thing. It's one dimensional equation. It's a piece of cake compared to tur turbulence, but still, I haven't done it. What I did instead was, uh, yes, and this thing, remember, depends on P and Q, and it's like coupling constant, which is depending on rational number. It's something we never encountered in field theory. Not only you have to solve field theory, but then you also have to average it over ensemble of uh, random fractions, which is a unusual task, but number theorists enjoy such things. Okay, so let me go to the solution. Um, uh, we found out that in the continuum limit, when n goes to infinity, you cannot just replace p over q by a random variable varying from zero to uh, one. You naively would think that the fractions uh, would be replaced by mm, numbers, but that's not true because those quantization of these numbers and conditions that they are co-prime plays important role in the limit of n goes to infinity. That's the number theory at work. So I found out that there are two combinations. One is cotangent squared of p over q. You see, at small p over q, it has a pole which cancels this one, and it goes to one over p squared, but p is an integer. So this variable is not just a continuous variable. In the limit of large Q, it becomes quantized. So there is a distribution. It turns out that the Euler ensemble can allows you to derive explicit form of distribution of this variable in the limit, and another one uh, is Q over N. So these distributions, I'm not going to prove anything, look like that. So that's distribution of Y. Uh, y is ratio of q over n, and it is has, it's rather trivial. It's sum uh, of delta functions times what's called Euler totient. Euler totient is number of fractions uh, with given denominator, and it's computed by Euler. It's a beautiful formula involving product of um, primes. So, uh, so beta n can be expressed in terms of both variables, because it's uh, n times arcotangent of this, and it goes to the function of both variables. So to skip this number theory stuff, which requires some work, but that's not a physics work. We could just let number theorists do that. I did it myself, but they will rubber stamp it, I hope, because that is uh, rather standard methods. So, oh, yes, that's the most important. Now, I still have some time. How much time do I have? Six, seven. Okay, so now I'm going to present results using these mm, uh, asymptotic distributions of uh, random fractions and using supercomputer. I found simulation of this. Markov chain is something ideal for uh, uh, to simulate on a computer. You just have two numbers. It's not like you're simulating large system with many degrees of freedom, have two degrees of freedom. It's like, I don't know, uh, I can buy on your side. You could do it on your laptop, except, I mean, on your uh, HP 25 calculator, like um, Figenbaum did, but it will take uh, 20 years. But on the supercomputer, it takes a week. And that's what we did. We took very large number of, um, of, of points in a circle, 200 million, and uh, we collected large statistics, and we obtained statistical results which look like uh, analytic because there is an invisible statistical error. And uh, the observable we computed is the correlation function. Correlation function corresponds to a very simple path. Uh, it corresponds to the path which goes between two points, zero and r, goes 
from zero to R and then backtracks from R to one. And, in, and at point zero and then point R, you have the vorticity operator inserted. And I don't have time to describe it, but vorticity operator, which finds from variation of this Wilson loop with respect to shape of the loop, uh, brings down vorticity, uh, corresponds to cross product of P and delta P. So when we do that, we obtain the following formula, which again, I'm not going to derive. So correlation of vorticity at the point zero and vorticity at the point R reduces to the following thing in our solution. So that's the kinematic factor, one over T squared. Then there is sum over all point N and M is position of these two insertion points in a circle. And then that in exponential is what um, the, uh, my solution reduces. So it was exponential of some uh, integral of this function f, and that is what it, you get. So you get some very specific expression depending on this f, and f, remember, was this um, exponential of alpha, et cetera, et cetera. And omega here are represent vorticity operators, and they are very, very simple. And they in, in, in involve cotangent of beta over two. So it's cotangent of rational fraction of pi. And that is very interesting quantity, which you can study in number theory. So it's beautiful, some, some rules which I derived. Yes? Yes. Oh, time is doesn't change. I, my solution has time as a parameter. I'm not mo longer playing with time dependence. I solved my solution was for p of theta. Not time now enters as a parameter in the denominator. So my variables are only variables on the loop. So time is a parameter. Yes, everything is at fixed time. I'm talking about single, about decaying turbulence. So at some time t, I have vorticity, and vorticity is represented by this vector, uh, and everything corresponds to fixed time. And this time enters in rather trivial fashion here, but in, it also enters in non-trivial fashion here because this variable rho is dimensionless variable, is r divided by the diffusion radius. So time is not yet, completely trivial, it enters here and here. That's it. So uh, the formula simplify in Fourier space because it was a very simple thing. It was exponential of something times, uh, yes, it was exponential of something times coordinate. So when we go to Fourier, we'll get delta function. Delta function is something you shouldn't be scared of because you still have some integration over these random numbers distribution. So delta function would fit nicely that integration. Uh, that means integration will become simpler than, uh, than uh, you would have in coordinate space because you will have to expon integrate exponential and average and here you have already delta function. So once you do that, we simulate it this Markov chain, obtain some distributions, and when it does settled, we found this uh, remarkable relation. The two variables uh, which we measured, one was a logarithm of this omega dot omega divided by Q squared, another was, I call it here uh, K, but it's not K, it is mm, this variable. Uh, in, 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 uh, because of delta function, uh, uh, this variable W, which we found, which we measured this variable, of course, and but delta function says this variable equals k times square root of et cetera, et cetera. So we find distribution of this variable and find distribution of another variable, uh, which is related to omega dot omega. So we found this is sort of joint distribution of this variable given value of that variable. Uh, that's what we measured. Uh, so we measured that. There are plenty of interesting technical details. I will gladly discuss it with experts in computer simulation. But anyway, the, what we obtained is a remarkably simple thing. We found that these things 
which look like independent random variables, are so strongly correlated that uh, you cannot really see the error bars on the line. So the red dots are the error bars, and that line perfectly fits um, in log-log scale by a straight line. So we found a scaling law. We found a scaling law with some non-trivial index. That's what we found in simulation. And when we substituted that, just give me one more minute, I'm sorry. I was fighting with the remote control. So here is, okay. Here is what we get for the correlation function. It is a correlation function, essentially as a function of a single variable, which is k times square root of nu t. And I call it k capital. So it looks like a, uh, in, in log log scale, it looks like a scaling law. But if you look, take a, a zoom into, it is made, it's like devil's staircase. It's made of, of slanted steps. Each step has slope minus one. But when you, average over some time interval, you'll get slope, which is uh, my, approximately minus two. So here it is. Welcome to the Devil's Staircase. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are, thank you very much. We are. And the details are described in my paper, which is. The details will be discussed now in the five minutes questions. Yes. <laughs> so please uh, open the uh, section in the question uh, section. Are there questions, remarks? Shini. What are the concretely testable results from uh, this? Again? Concretely testable results from uh, your There's presentation. There's a double sound. If you just. Uh, the, the concrete results. Concrete, concrete testable. Can you give us uh, something to measure on a direct numerical scale? This is, OK. Yes, I have a microphone. Here is what you measure. That's formally, that's energy spectrum. Of vorticity. So it is a explicit formula involving some function, which is this. So that is the function which so, you're supposed to measure. So if you plug, if you, if you try to make the Fourier transform and look at the, the spatial dependency, as a function of R. You have a power law in R? No, I have a quantum power law. You have delta, some of delta functions and, and some of step functions, and in average, they look like a power. Okay. But what I claim is that spectrum of this decaying turbulence is discrete. Kill me here if you want, but that's what no, I claim. No, no, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the formula. This H have delta terms, which means there are very small peaks, numerical peaks, and this B is approximately 1.03. So there are peaks and there is a uh, steps. There is a, so you have something which if you are short-sighted, you will think is a power law like K minus two. But if you really measure very well, you'll find that this, um, this function, which was plotted on the previous what so, are those steps? Where do they come from? This, this function. I mean, no, you, you can't show me an equation. You have to tell me a little bit more. you have to fix more. this thing. It's impossible to work. Yes. Okay, yes. anyway. So this function uh, has uh, locally dependence k minus 1. This is variable, scaling variable, k times diffusion parameter square root of nu t. So this locally has a slope k minus 1. But when you go to small, smaller and smaller k, there's a limiting largest k, it, it starts to look as a, a curve with a slope approximately minus, minus two. two. Yes. Minus two, okay. k to minus two means uh, in, uh, in real space, uh, you should have a what? A power law with minus... Uh, it's not exactly minus two, it's yeah. minus two point or something. So I did not try to please uh, engineers. I didn't try to make things uh, uh, look like something measurable. No, but I you, simply solved the question. No, I tried to please you can number ask a theory. to measure things. You 
So if my equations don't fit experiment, let's see what I assume. Maybe I assume something which is not yet implemented in experiment, or maybe experiment has too small. Uh, no, but now there are the very big numerical simulation by Kartik, PK, Young, and they might certainly try to, to check. What I, I'm dying to do the following thing. I want with my dear friend Srini and my dear friend Kartik to run the same thing on a big supercomputer mm -hmm. and eliminate all uh, questions. I will have 10 times smaller errors and I will know for sure, do I have that uh, index uh, indeed? And then, because the rest is kinematical. This function is so uh, uh, sharp with all these steps, assuming there is this scaling law. I derive this scaling law only numerically, but, uh, but since I have very large statistics and very large n, my statistical errors are very small. But in the numerical simulation uh, or in an experiment, the problem will be to select the initial conditions to follow, yes, yes, yes. To follow that your That is branch. very important. What I would want to experiment. There Here is, is an question experiment. By, a question by Raul, last, last one. Yes, I wanted to answer that. You implicitly asked the question. No, I think it's the same question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you're, you have a formula for E k comma t. In particular, I can evaluate it at t equal to zero. So instead of going through your way of creating the initial condition, I could into a pseudospectral simulation put in UKs with random phases, which will give me the same energy EK spectrum at time zero. Then I plug it in, then I have the answer. I think you should be able to check the temporal decay. No, I cannot, unfortunately, I cannot solve equations with fixed conditions. I found the fixed point. What I, I did not, I, don't, I did not solve the Cauchy problem for decaying turbulence. That I didn't do. What I found is self-consistent asymptotic solution, fixed yeah. trajectory. Okay, I think it's, uh, I mean, thank you very much. Now it's really too late. We need to move to the second talk. Thank you again, uh, Sasha, for these inspiring talks. We have now to move uh, to the second talk by Spenta Vadia. Don't we have a T? No. We have a second talk, right? No? Yes. Uh, unless they change the, the, the program. Okay, good.